Hello, good morning, everybody. What a treat for my daughter Candace and I to get to be back here at, at New Hope. I've been here uh, for a couple of different events, and so knowing that God was going to allow me to come back this weekend, I got super duper excited and uh, just love what God's doing here in your church. Do you love your church? Come on, do you thank God for your church? You're a part of a blessed house, and I want to say thanks to Pastor Jeff for the privilege. And uh, I don't take it lightly that you would allow us to come and be a part of what God's doing here in this house. And Pastor Weaver, like you just really have uh, shepherds that lead you. Uh, they love God. They love you. They're committed to the word of God. I mean, just the entire staff spending time with Pastor Austin and August. I mean, all, all of them, Pastor Luke and, and Zach, just Pastor Brian. When I talk to these guys, I just see Jesus in them. Whether we're, we're talking over a plate of chicken strips or uh, talking around the altars, you can just see Jesus in them. And one more time, can you just say thank you, God, for your pastors here at New Hope Church? Come on. Just put your hands together. Well, I do have a picture of my family that I would love to show you. My wife, Casey, uh, I send you greetings on her behalf. But uh, there she is in the picture right there in the middle, my bride. And then check that out, y'all. Six kids. Would you just take a moment and just uh, offer up a prayer for me, would you? Because they're kind of starting to hit that relationship age and the college age and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just praying for the rapture. Would you agree with me? Just, let's, just, let's just have Jesus go ahead and come back. That would be great. But as you can tell, the six kiddos, they are all boys except for the five girls. So you see them there. Candace, Kelly, Grace, Bria, Allison, and Angel, and then uh, my champ, Jordan, and so really and truly, I, I do thank the Lord for, for Jordan. He was here with me on the last trip. He loved this place. You guys just, just spoiled him rotten with hospitality and making him feel welcome, and, uh, and yet my five girls, oh, those are my princesses. I love them. I have such a close and special relationship with each one of them, and uh, I am glad that Candace, my oldest, is a able to uh, be with me this weekend. So, sweetheart, would you just stand and wave? And this is her. If you could welcome Candace, if you would. And I'm so proud of Candace and the way she loves God and is serving God. As a matter of fact, she, she set a goal that she wanted to write a book. She wrote her first book. She wanted to write it before she finished high school. And the Lord helped her to do that. She finished her first book. She had so much fun. Her first year of college, she went ahead and cranked out another one. And so I'm just looking at her going, I stand in awe of how God is using you. Like, that is incredible. I do not have that gift, but she does. And so she wrote a couple of books now uh, for teenage girls. So if you are a teenage girl or you have a teenage girl in your life, I know that this book would be a blessing. It's just a memoir that she's captured how God's been working in her and through her as she chases Jesus. And it is very insightful, but also entertaining. And so Candace will be out at the Welcome Center after the service today with her books, if you would like to go by and uh, purchase a copy of that. But I'm so proud of you, baby girl. So way to go serving Jesus. Well, if you've been a part of the last couple of nights, I say welcome back. If you weren't able to attend either of those, I just say good morning to you and even a special welcome to those who are watching online. I love it when it's impossible for you to be physically on site that you still stay committed to your church family. That is so important. And uh, I, I know there's nothing like having your face in the place and, and being here and, and being together with God's family. And uh, the last couple of nights, we've already just seen the Lord do some wonderful things and, and speaking to hearts and lives. Last night, we talked about how uh, really things are more spiritual than we realize. And oftentimes we can overlook just the spiritual realm and how God is at work. And, and that really is a truth. And, and uh, tonight, I hope that you'll make every effort to be a part of tonight's service as we're going to be talking about the supernatural power of God. How many of you know that our God is a supernatural God? 
that he has all power, that God can do anything. So especially if you find yourself in a place to where you're needing a miracle in your life, I've just been praying and believing that God would do what only God could do and that he would work miracles, maybe a healing in your body. Uh, maybe you're needing a miracle in your marriage. Maybe there's just some situation that you're really just needing something that's beyond the normal. You're just saying, I need, I need the omnipotent one, the all-powerful God to step into this and to do what only he can do then you want to make sure and come tonight and come with faith in your heart, come with anticipation, and why don't you go ahead and bring 43 of your closest friends with you tonight, okay? So you go ahead and come tonight. Well, to be sure, God is a supernatural God. And what I'd like to talk to you today is about what it means to be practically supernatural, uh, I'd like to propose to you that our steps to seeing spiritual victories and breakthroughs are often more practical than we realize. Said another way, the super practical is more connected to the supernatural than we often think. And Scripture really is saturated with this truth, and, and uh, I believe that God goes to great lengths to help us to see just how important it is that we would connect our practical steps in life to the supernatural that he's wanting to do in your situation and in mine. Have you ever read any Bible stories that as you're reading them, you just kind of stop and you scratch your head just a little bit? Come on, don't look at me like you're so spiritual. Acknowledge it. Come on, just admit it. You've read something before and it's made you just go, hmm, I wonder what God was up to with that. Uh, some, some of us have been around church way too long to where we read stories in the Bible and we just right past it, like no big deal, like, yep, that, that completely makes sense, that's totally logical, it's completely normal. Like, let me just give you a few examples, because uh, if you've been around church for a while, you'll know about the story of Joshua, and, and how God delivered Jericho into the hands of the people of Israel, the people of God. So, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came See, Sunday school works. It really does. It's paying off, and we know, we know our Bible songs. Joshua for the battle, Jericho. And the walls came tumbling down. We're like, yes, they did. Glory. Hallelujah. Yes, that's what happened. Joshua for the battle of Jericho. Yes, he did. And the walls came tumbling down. Absolutely. That's what the song says. The wall. Yeah, but have you thought about the story? God said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to march around of the city. Okay, Lord, and then what? That's all. Just go take you a break. I'll go hang out a little bit. I'll let you know. So they march around the walls. Then they kick into chillaxing, just taking it easy. Just next day, what? A, march around the walls. Come on, you remember the story, right? What happens on the seventh day? March around the wall seven times. And they did. And then what happened? And the walls came because they marched around the wall. Totally logical. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? No, 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 no. We have become so familiar with our Bible stories that we've lost our sense of what in the world was God up to there. Let me give you another example. Do you remember the story in Matthew when Simon Peter came to Jesus and he's like, hey, you know, people talking about paying taxes, saying that we need to pay taxes. Like, I mean, I know you're Jesus and everything, but do we need to pay taxes? And, and Jesus is like, yeah, we probably should. Now, I don't know for sure, but I think whenever Jesus says to Peter, yes, we need to pay taxes, I think he probably paused for dramatic effect. You know, because Jesus just messed with you. Come on, read your Bible. You see, sometimes they'll ask Jesus a question, and Jesus asks them a question. You know, he's like, I was looking for an answer, but you just asked me another question. Like, Jesus, I believe, would just mess with them sometimes. And I believe he did with Peter in this situation when he said, should we pay our taxes? And Jesus is like, yeah, we probably should. 
You know that awkward moment when you're at lunch with somebody and the waiter comes over and says, one check or two, and the person looks away? That means they're expecting you to pay. You know what I'm saying? And I think Peter said, should we pay taxes? And Jesus is like, yeah. <laughs> Peter's like, okay, well, um, because what had happened was, uh, I was going to have some money, but I don't. And Jesus could have messed with it and been like, then what is this behind your ear? <sighs> Go pay the taxes. Like he could have done that, but he didn't. Are you familiar with this story? Do you remember what he did? He said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go fishing. Peter's like, uh-huh. And I want you to throw out that, yep. First fish that you catch, uh-huh. Scripture says Jesus told him, I want you to reach into its mouth and pull out a coin and go pay the taxes. You've got to quit being so familiar with your Bible to where when I say that, you go, yeah. That's what happened. <laughs> go fishing, first fish that you catch, reach in its mouth and pull out a coin. Yeah, that happens every day. What is God trying to show us? On his way to doing something supernatural, he will often call you and me to do something super practical. Have you ever experienced that in your life? I want to show you one of my favorite scriptures. I want a story that we're actually going to teach from today on some very practical steps to spiritual breakthroughs. And it's pretty similar to marching around a wall or going fishing and reaching into the mouth of a fish to see God do something supernatural. It comes from Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8. This is the story where the enemy army of the Israelites, the people of God, the enemy army, the Amalekites were coming against them. Let's pick up the story with verse 8. If you're ready for this, say, uh-huh. If you really mean it, say, oh yeah. Tell your neighbor right now, get ready to listen to God. Go ahead and tell them that. Get ready to listen to God because God wants to talk to you. Verse 8, it says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of of the hill as long as listen to this as long as Moses you got to hear this are you tracking are you focused as long as Moses held up his hands the Israelites were winning but whenever he lowered his hands the Amalekites were winning I'm going to pause right there just for a moment to make sure that you're not just reading through this too quickly and you're missing what was just said. There's a fight going on. There's a battle taking place. And Scripture just said, as long as Moses' hands were raised, the Israelites were winning. But when his hands were down, they were losing. How many of you would admit with me today that that does not make a lick of sense? Come on, just wave at me if you would just agree with that. Because some of y'all are so familiar with the story. His hands were up, they were winning. Mm -hmm. His hands went down and they were losing. Absolutely. But you hadn't stopped to think about what in the world was that all about. And here's another question for you. How did they figure that out? How did they figure out that when his hands were up, they were winning? And when his hands were down, they were losing. Did they go out, Moses, like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Come on, guys, let's go. Oh, yeah. Ooh, look, oh, this is incredible. We are dominating. Oh, you guys are amazing. Oh, oh, what's happening? Oh, no, we're losing. Oh, come on, guys, you got to, oh, oh. Yeah. Like, how did they figure it out? How do they even know? And then did Moses start messing with them? (laughs) 
There's a lot about that I don't understand, but I do want to remind you today that every single word in God's book is there for a reason. And every picture that he gives us has a purpose to teach us. All we really know when we stop and think about this picture is that there seems to be some connection between the practical and the supernatural, that his practical involvement partnered with God led to God's spiritual intervention in the battle. What if today you were just a few practical steps away from seeing God bring about a breakthrough for something you've been praying for in your life? What if there's something that you're needing, that you're looking to God for, and you feel like you're waiting on God, and today you could discover that actually God's been waiting on you, and you're just a few practical steps away from seeing the supernatural in your life. Are you open to that today? If you are, let me just give you a few thoughts to consider when it comes to positioning yourself in a practical sense for a spiritual work that God wants to do. Number one, if you're taking notes, which I think that'd be really awesome. If you are, it would give me the impression that you're listening. Okay, so if you're taking notes, that would be wonderful. You could write down number one, when it comes to so spiritual breakthroughs, what are some practical steps? Number one, do whatever God tells you to do. And you're like, well, that's profound right there. Well, it's a great starting point if you want to see miracles in your life is that you would do what you already know to do. You would step out and obey what God's already told you to do. Throughout Exodus, we see God telling Moses to do something and Moses would do it. God would speak and he would say, like in Exodus chapter 14, lift up your hands, take your staff and stretch it out over the water. And whenever he did, what happened? The Red Sea parted. How many of you know that God could have parted the Red Sea without Moses or the staff. It had nothing to do with the waters waiting to see the staff. It had to do with God saying to Moses, this is what I want you to do. Now watch what only I can do. There was a connection between the practical and the spiritual or the supernatural. That's why when we come in Exodus chapter 17 and we're seeing now another step here, we know that Moses is not just messing around. He's not just like seeing if this work or let me try this or what if I stand on my head or what if I clap my hands. We know that he has learned to be obedient to whatever it is that God has spoken to him to do. Unfortunately, many of us miss out on the blessings of God and what he has for our lives, not because of a lack of knowledge, but rather a lack of obedience. Meaning, oftentimes what we're needing by way of God to help us or to intervene, our next step is not just a matter of, Lord, if you would just show us what to do, or if you would just do what only you can do. Instead, oftentimes our very next step, what's paralyzed us or what's hindering us or holding back is we have failed to take a step on what God has already spoken to us to do. To put it bluntly, when it comes to us being confused or not understanding what's happening in our lives or, or being stuck in a situation, I would say there are far too many Christians, just to put it bluntly, that we are deceived. Like, we don't, we don't understand because we have bought into a lie or we have bought a lie. We're, we're, we're deceived in our thinking. I'll show you what I'm talking about out of James chapter 1. You always, no matter what you're going through, you always want to say, what does the Bible say? Like the other night we talked about heaven. What does the Bible say about heaven? Last night we talked about spiritual battles, spiritual warfare. What does the Bible say about spiritual warfare? When it comes to us following God and his word and doing what we're supposed to, what does the Bible say? about it. Listen, James chapter 1 verse 22. It says, do not merely listen to the word, check this out, and so deceive yourselves. You can actually go to church and still be living in deception. You can actually read your Bible every single day but still be living a deceived life. James is saying, don't merely listen to the word 
and as a result be deceived, so deceive yourselves. What does it say in this next part? Look at it. It says, do what it says. Come on, everybody say that with me. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intensely into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but, what does it say? But in doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. We can be deceived, and a lot of churchgoers are we can live with this false sense of security because we have a knowledge of our God's, of God's word. We've heard about some great sermons, some great messages. We know some Bible stories. But the real issue is not do I know it, but do I do it? The blessing, James is saying, is not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. How silly would it be if I said to you that, yes, I've gone to a fitness instructor and, and they have explained to me how I'm supposed to exercise or maybe someone's wanting to lose some weight and say, I talked to the fitness instructor and they gave me a plan to lose 25 pounds. I'm super excited about that. So I'm just celebrating the fact that I'm losing 25 pounds and somebody says, that's really cool. So did you go to the gym? No. Are you exercising? No. No. But I've got the plan right here, and I've read it multiple times, and I love the way the instructor laid it out. I love the way he, he gave pictures and illustrations of how I'm to exercise. He gave me benchmarks and mile markers and goals to say, I really enjoy that. Well, have you taken a lap around the neighborhood? No. How strange would it be if somebody got excited after meeting with a financial advisor who said, listen, here's how you can retire as a millionaire. Here's what it would take and laid out the goals and all of a sudden you got excited. Woo, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm excited to be a millionaire. Oh, that's really cool. Tell me about it. Oh, he told me, here's how you budget. Here's how you set these goals. Here's how you invest. I'm going to be a millionaire. Oh, ha have, you, have you started your budget? Not yet. Are you saving anything? No. Are you spending less than you're bringing in? No, not exactly. But I've got this magnet on my refrigerator with inspirational quotes about being a millionaire. I read it every single day. As a matter of fact, we even sing songs. Our family's so excited about being millionaires. We sing songs about being millionaires. Listen, the blessing is not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. And there are a lot of church-going folk who will talk about the things of God, who will even read the Word of God. But when they look at our life, there's a breakdown between our belief and our behavior. The blessing is not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. And as you study the word of God, you not only read it, but you allow it to read you like looking into a mirror. It's one thing to look into the mirror. The question is, when I do look in the mirror, do I do something about what I see? Some of you looked in the mirror this morning and it, it increased your prayer life. You just looked at it like, oh, dear Jesus, help me, heaven, help me. Some people want to rebuke the mirror. Oh, no, I don't. The mirror's going, oh, yes, you do. You can rebuke it. You can even say, well, you know what? That's a fair representation, but go away. And you do nothing about it. And James is saying the blessing is not just in the knowing, but in the doing. What are some of the things that as you read the word of God, God is speaking to you that you need to start doing? Have you started them? As you read the word of God, what are some of the things that he's showing you that you need to stop doing? Have you stopped doing them don't be deceived don't buy the lie when you put the word to work in your life it works but the blessing is in the doing God what is it that you're saying to me to do and when it says in God's word that we're to love our enemies have you ever noticed just how skilled we are at making excuses for not doing what God's word tells us to do. 
you've, you've run across maybe a scripture on loving the enemies and you read it. And it's not that you disagree with it because we, we're too holy for that, right? Well, I mean, it's in God's word. It's obvious. He says, love our enemies. So we believe in that. It's just different when that verse has a name and a face in my life. So I believe we're supposed to love our enemies, but I'm just like an Olympic gold medalist at excusing why he does not mean her or him. Some of you are like that. You look at it and like, listen, God understands. God knows what I'm dealing with here. God knows what I'm going to get. Like, Jesus don't even like her. Listen, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, he does not expect me to, no. Nah. Instead of saying, what does the word say? Then that's what I need to do. I mean, I know that the word of God says that I'm supposed to use my time, my talent, my treasure for his glory. Like I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm God's workmanship created to do uh, great works, good works in Christ Jesus. I know that. I know that I'm supposed to be a good steward of what he's entrusted to me. I'm supposed to build his church. I'm supposed to build his kingdom. But God understands my schedule. He knows I would if I could. And he understands why I can't jump in and serve the house of God on Sundays. Like, I do believe that's important. And somebody somewhere ought to do it. Bless them. Here's why I can't. I know what the word says about giving of my tithe. I know that first 10%, it belongs to the Lord. It's an act of worship. And I try, like, that's beautiful. Like, I actually know that's wonderful. I totally get it. That's important. God understands in my situation, things are just a little tight right now. And so he gets it. Am I the only one who's good at making excuses for not doing the word? See, the blessing is not in the knowing. The blessing is in the doing. How do I position myself for God to do a, supernatural work or breakthrough in my life. Number one, just do what he says to do. Here's the second thing. This is a very important one. It's trust God's ways. Not only to do his word, but to trust his ways. Because when I think about this story with Moses, I look at it and realize that Moses developed the ability to trust God even when he didn't understand him. Because there's no way that you could convince me that when God would tell Moses to do some of these things, that it logically made sense to Moses. There's no way that when he said, I want you to stretch out your hands or to lift your staff, Moses is like, yes, that's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> yes, that makes perfect sense. Listen, it wasn't a magic trick for Moses. It wasn't like Moses just was born and, and lived his whole life being like, man, cool thing. Watch this right here. This would be really awesome. And it's the same thing for you and me. Like, it, it's not a, like, let me just tell you, if I had that supernatural power, this world would be messed up because I'd just be using it all the time. Like, if my favorite sports team was, like, behind and we weren't winning, I'd just be like, Go ahead and get the W. You know, go just get. I, I wouldn't just use the sport. I would use this. Come on, parents. You know this would come in handy at home, wouldn't it? Don't make me come in there and lift my hands. You know that would be so awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, just argument with my wife. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> what a magic trick. It didn't make sense. And there are times that God will speak to you and, and he'll call you to do something or he'll, he'll say, yes, despite where you are in your budget, here's how I'm wanting you to trust me. Despite how busy you may feel, here's what I want you to prioritize. Despite someone that hasn't been kind to you, here's how I want you to love them. He will call us to do something that does not make sense. Yes, they hurt me, but God says, I want you to forgive them. That does not make sense. It's almost like he's telling me to go and grab a fish and put my hand in the mouth you have anything like that in your life despite your unsaved husband or wife who may not even be with you here at church today and God is saying keep loving them keep loving them keep loving them you're like that makes about as much sense as you telling me march around the wall but because you said it, I'll do it. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
God's ways are beyond our ability to understand, but they're never weird for the sake of being weird. God has a purpose and a plan for every step he's calling you and me to take. The real issue is will we do his, his word, do what he says, and trust his ways even when they don't make sense? Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible. And without faith it is, what does it say? Impossible to please God. It doesn't say that it's challenging. It doesn't say that it's difficult. It says that without faith it is, say it with me, impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. As we set out to walk with God and to live for God, we will discover that he calls us to walk by faith, not by sight. Is there an area in your life that as you look at it, you realize the only reason you're taking this step is because you're trusting God and it is a step of faith? And if not, what kind of life am I living that requires zero faith, zero trust in God? I have it all figured out. I have it all mapped out. That's a great place to step back and pause and examine myself to see what kind of worship, what kind of devotion I'm truly living with in my service to God. Because without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. What steps of faith would God be calling you to take? And I just want you to know, don't be deceived. Do what he says and trust his ways. Even when things don't make sense, walk by faith, not by sight. And you will see that God is at work. See, I love the thought of God bringing miracles my way and moving supernaturally on my behalf. But what I'm learning is sometimes God does a miracle, sometimes God does something supernatural, but oftentimes he first calls me to do something super practical and it does not always make sense to me. I love the thought of God being a healer. How many of you know that our God heals? Come on, just wave at me. You know that our God is a healer. God, like you could have something that you're going through right now and you pray and God just, bam, in that moment, heal you. We're gonna be praying for that tonight. And here's what I've learned. Sometimes God heals you. Sometimes God helps you. Here's what I mean by that. And I'm not trying to sound unspiritual, I'm just telling you, as I read scripture and I look at how God works in my life, here's what I've discovered. Sometimes he heals me, sometimes he helps me. And he shows me that his grace is sufficient no matter what I'm going through. Let me be a little more practical. If you have asthma and you're praying that God would heal you of asthma, sometimes he will heal you of asthma. Sometimes he'll send you an inhaler. And what about going, thank you, Lord, for providing I pray for complete healing, but I thank you for my inhaler. Some of you are praying for provision. You're like, Jehovah Jireh, I just need you to provide. You heard a story about somebody getting a check in the mail, and ever since then, you check your mailbox about eight times a day. You know what I've discovered? Sometimes he sends a check in the mail. Sometimes he sends you a Dave Ramsey podcast. Sometimes he intervenes in a miraculous way. Sometimes when you're praying for your marriage to be reconciled, sometimes God just touches the heart of that person, uh, your spouse and touches your heart. Sometimes he says, here's what you need to do. Go see a counselor. Like, Lord, I'm too spiritual for that. I just need a miracle. And he's saying, actually, y'all just need to learn to communicate. Like for my wife and me, one of the greatest breakthroughs in our marriage, and we have a wonderful marriage, a blessed marriage, but like any marriage, it's challenging at times. One of our most amazing breakthroughs is that we started meeting together on Friday mornings to pray together and to talk through the family schedule. <laughs> and it was almost as if the Red Seas parted. <laughs> Sometimes God does something supernatural, but he oftentimes waits for us to do something super practical. What is he speaking to you? Let me give you the third and the final piece, and the worship team can come and get in place if you would. 
Number three, what if you're doing your best to obey God's word and you're doing your best to trust his ways and you're so trying to posture yourself and put yourself in position to receive from God and yet you still haven't seen the breakthrough or the miracle in the way that you had hoped to. Number three is this. You can write this down. Refuse to quit. Just don't give up. Back to our story of Moses, it says in verse 12, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up, held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. And so it says in verse 13, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. As long as his hands were up, they were winning. But after a little while, his arms started getting tired. Come on, you can understand that. I don't know how long the battle lasted, but it certainly lasted longer than our praise and worship. But for some of y'all today, y'all got tired after the second song. Come on, you know you were. You started off just both hands up, and after a few minutes, man, that right one, because that arthritis started working on you. You know, you had to drop it. After a little while, whoo, boy, I tell you what, Moses out there on the battlefield. Hands up, winning. Getting tired. What was at stake was more important than his comfort or the convenience or his fatigue. So he had to purpose and he had to figure out a way to say, whatever I have to do, I'm going to do it because I refuse to quit. And you know the key to some of the miracles that God has for you and the breakthroughs that he already has in store and in mind for you? You know what your super practical step is? Here's as crazy as it gets. Just don't give up. That's one of the reasons I just celebrate the fact that you're here today and that you came to God's house. I love it. I respect it. Because for some of you, it was a very, very difficult choice and decision to even get out of bed, to get dressed and come because of what you're carrying, because we all face adversity. Sometimes you get tired, and we're talking about really tired, discouraged. We get tired of the pain. We get worn down with the conflict in the home. We get tired of suffering. We get tired of working sun up to sundown. We get tired of parenting. We get tired of fighting the depression. We get tired of fighting the anxiety and we feel like giving up because we're just too tired to keep going. And I want you to know that God may give you supernatural strength or he may just give you the courage to take one more step in the right direction and then after you do that to take another one I really encourage you today to not give up to don't lose heart don't give in to discouragement to remember that when we are weak he is strong God is with you he has not forgotten about you you're not stuck in your current pain forever. He's right there with you in the fire. And he will eventually bring you out. He will sustain you along the way. Don't give up. For me, there are some days that my biggest victory is when I do this followed by followed by can anybody relate and you need to celebrate it thank you God that you're with me thank you God that you're for me thank you God that you're going to strengthen me today you're going to give me just what I need to do what I need to do I celebrate you I thank you Lord for sustaining me and you know what else we need Sometimes we need an Aaron and a Hur to come alongside. 
that's why it's important to be involved in Sunday school. That's why it's important to have community from this church because there are days that I need voices alongside of me saying, Scotty, don't you give up. Can anybody relate to that? I need an Aaron or her to lift my arms. Some of you, you need to have those godly voices around you saying, don't you throw in the towel. Don't you give up on that son who's away from God. Don't you give up on that daughter who's not serving Jesus. Don't you give up on that miracle in your body. Don't you give up on that marriage. We need the Aaron's and hers. And can I say this? Sometimes God's calling you to be the Aaron or the her. Sometimes we feel like, no, I'm good. I don't need it. Then who needs God to use you to be a voice of encouragement? I mean, Aaron can, and her could have been like, why does Moses get to sit down on the rock? Oh, y'all can only find one rock? We only have one rock around here? Moses gets the rock? They could have said, man, holding up the arms of somebody stinketh. You know Moses had to have had a bath in how long? We don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes it's hard to lift the arms of somebody. But that's what the family of God looks like. I'm just wondering, who's still in church today because of you? Who's still in their marriage today because of you? Who's still with Jesus today because of you? God will use you to be that voice that says, don't give up. We need each other. And I just want to pray over you today. And then after I do, Pastor Jeff or Pastor Austin, whoever is going to close the service, can give direction for next steps. But I'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. I'm just by, wondering by a lift of hands, just raising your hands, how many of you would say today, Scotty, today God has spoken something to my heart. I have a practical step, something he's wanting me to do. And I would say, by God's grace, I'm going to take that step. Come on, just raise it up, would you, all over the room? Awesome, awesome. Every single section, hands going up. We'll do our part. To do his word, trust his ways, and refuse to quit. Lord, I just pray that as we close, whatever the practical step is, whatever you want to do, I pray in the name of Jesus that you give us the boldness to take it. We would walk in your ways. We would do your will. We would trust you. And Lord, we would keep on keeping on for the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name.